And what fine tuning found out, what was found out by the physicists in the physics literature, you know, professional stuff, was actually there's something really remarkable about our electrons and sort of there's a narrow range of possible values where electrons do something interesting. In particular, because um, once you start messing with, say, the mass of an electron, what you're really doing is changing like the budget sheet of the universe. What processes are allowed to happen because there's enough energy? What aren't allowed to happen because there's not enough energy? And uh, with by changing that number, you can just make you can erase the periodic table. You can just make it the case that um, nothing in an atom sticks to anything else. So you would have a universe full of fundamental particles incapable of producing anything complex. We live in a world where there is more access to information than ever before. Generations, young and old, are being exposed to radically different ideologies and opinions every day. It can be so overwhelming trying to decipher what's true and what's false, but there is a way. Join me as we discuss some of the toughest questions out there about Christianity, the Bible, and culture. I'm your host, Nick Lackey. Welcome to The Garrison. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Garrison. For many Christians, it's enough for them to believe in God and that they have experienced Him in one sense or another. But for non-Christians, this may not be enough. And often they want empirical evidence and scientific reasons to believe in the Christian God. Which is why today we've got with us Dr. Luke Barnes, who is a senior lecturer in astronomy and cosmology at Western Sydney University. He's an astrophysicist with a PhD from the University of Cambridge, and he's a co-author of a number of books, including A Fortunate Universe and The Cosmic Revolutionaries Handbook. And Luke is actually our first international guest, and he comes uh, all the way from Australia. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a small island <laughs> off the coast of New Zealand. Is that right, Luke? It is indeed, yeah. The West Island, I yeah. believe it's called, yeah. <laughs> oh, awesome. And apart from your impressive credentials here, uh, what else is there to know about you, Luke? Um, I live in Sydney, yeah, with my wife and two kids. Uh, I play cricket on the weekends and, uh, yeah, I really enjoy being an astrophysicist. It's a great job. Yeah, and uh, shout out to Josh King. He's, he's organized the interview today and it's so good to, to get you in in the, the short window of time that we had. But today I really want to focus on the scientific reasons to believe in God, you know, and often I engage with non-Christians and they say, you know, there's no evidence for God. It's all just, it's wishful thinking. But as a Christian who who has looked somewhat into this stuff, I, I know that's not true. And, and you'll certainly know that's not true either. And so I want to get into your, your particular field, which is looking at fine tuning. And so to start us off and to lay the ground groundwork for this episode, you know, what is the fine tuning argument? And pe- perhaps before we get into the really detailed stuff, maybe <laughs> explain it to me as if I was like a five-year-old. <laughs> so... For, you know, the last 100, 150 years, if the, the, the sort of atheistic view of the world has tried to tell us again and again that, that this, this place is just an accident. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's just, just whatever, ever, any old universe, you just get some matter, you get any old physical laws and it'll just rearrange itself uh, into what we see around us. And there's nothing particularly noteworthy or remarkable going on around here. And what the fine-tuning argument does is says, well, let's actually take that very seriously. Let's really try and work out whether that statement is true or not um, because clearly we're seeing the world in different ways. Mm -hmm. And here's a way that we could do it. Why don't we um, try to systematically work out what the universe could have been like? There's, there's the way it works, but, you know, it is, is this just any old universe? If, if, you know, most physical universes that you throw together with any old laws end up looking a bit like this or something like this or something, you know, like, you know, comparable to this, mm-hmm. then fair enough, we're just any old universe and, you know, it was just us hoping we were special. Yeah. That, that would, you know, lead us to think that there's a God who made it all. Um, and so there's a method of doing this that, that, the fine-tuning argument looks at. And what's really interesting is that the the foundation of it is something that physicists did anyway. It wasn't a let's work out whether there's a God, let's, let's do that. This wasn't sort of made up by Christians. 
physicists doing their job as physicists said, okay, well, look, um, let's look at the deepest laws of the world that we know about, the laws of physics. What do we see there? Well, as, as well as a whole bunch of maths, there are some numbers that you've got to put in. So if you want to predict from the theories how the world works, you need to know numbers like, okay, there's a fundamental particle called an electron, mm -hmm. the thing that goes around an atom. How heavy is it? And there's a number for that. And in kilograms, it's obviously a really small number. And um, that's great. We can measure it, but we don't know why it is what it is. And so there's a chance to say, look, what if we just had any old electrons? Just ignore the fact that we know the answer for our universe. Just look at the whole range of what it could have had and just see what happens. And if it had turned out that, oh, you just get slightly heavier atoms or, you know, a slightly different periodic table or, you know, so, you know but water sort of you know, does something or other than something else, you know, then that would have sort of confirmed that this is the any old universe hypothesis, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And what fine-tuning found out, what was found out by the physicists in the physics literature, you know, professional stuff, was actually there's something really remarkable about our electrons and sort of there's a narrow range of possible values where electrons do something interesting. In particular because um, once you start messing with, say, the mass of an electron, what you're really doing is changing like the budget sheet of the universe. What processes are allowed to happen because there's enough energy? What aren't allowed to happen because there's not enough energy? And uh, with by changing that number, you can just make, you can erase the periodic table. You can just make it the case that um, nothing in an atom sticks to anything else. So you would have a universe full of fundamental particles incapable of producing anything complex. Mm. Um, you just they, they won't stick to each other. It's like a, a Lego set, you know, where you have your bricks and then you try to put the bricks together and they don't fit with each other. Nothing fits with anything. Like the most you could make out of that Lego set is like a pile of stuff and that's, that's your whole universe. So this is the idea of the fine-tuning argument. Actually, look, is the universe an accident? Is it just any old universe? Well, we, we can answer that with a bit of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and it, but it's already been done by physicists and it's done by physicists for other reasons. Mm. And the answer comes back, no, this, the, the, the universe we have, the sort of numbers that are underneath the surface at the bottom, um, really are, have, have some rather rare and unique properties. Mm. So you mentioned before about the electrons and if you'd change maybe the weight of them, it would, it would impact this universe in a significant way. So what are more of these constants and things which if we just changed them by a slight amount, it would mean that the universe we lived in wouldn't be a universe that we could live in. Right, so down at the bottom of physics, there's things called the standard models. There's called the standard model of particle physics, which is what are you made out of? And then there's the standard model of cosmology, which is what's the universe as a whole doing? Um, and when you boil those down to the best theories we have today, and it's just the best we have today, tomorrow might be different, but we're just taking stock of what we got. There's 31 numbers that are in those equations. And um, to be honest, a lot of them actually don't matter that much for life. So there are, it's not the case that all of these constants are fine-tuned. There's ones that deal with particles called neutrinos, which barely interact with the rest of matter. As, you know, they're just kind of... You can ruin a universe with them, but you've got to work pretty hard. Um, but there's a core set of, I'd say, maybe 10 of them, um, particularly the ones that have to do with the way uh, we're put together, the way our atoms and molecules sort of bind together and do interesting stuff, and the way the universe as a whole makes any sort of structure. There's a core set that where there's some sort of limit Sometimes that those limits are seem a little bit roomy. You know, there's a bit of space to move around here, um, and but some of them, and especially um, the the masses of the fundamental particles, is, is a great example. Over the entire range, you've really got to hit a hit a very small uh, subset if you want anything interesting to happen. And it's it's not um, there's no sort of life human carbon based life centric thing here you can sort of relax your what do you need a unit what what sort of universe you're calling interesting you could just sort of take all the options and plot 
how many how many elements are in the periodic table like how much on that level how much complexity is the universe capable of and there's our universe where there's 92 naturally occurring elements and out of those there are chemical databases of millions of chemical compounds um, but change these numbers a little bit and suddenly you know it's one or it's zero or it's 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 just a such a dramatic step towards too much simplicity so those are the sorts of numbers so the properties of the fundamental particles the properties of the forces that move those around um, and the way the universe expands several things about the way the universe was set up in the beginning um, are the sorts of things that make a big difference to fine tuning yeah, and when you mentioned before about the forces, are you referring to the, the strong nuclear force and the electromagnetic force yeah. and that kind of stuff? So take those, for instance. What would happen to our universe if we did change them to make them slightly stronger or weaker? Right, so th this is a, uh, an obvious sort of thing to change about the universe. Well, we know that as well as the stuff of the universe, there's ways they interact with each other. So um, you're familiar with gravity because we're all sitting on the floor, no one's sitting on the ceiling. Uh, there's electromagnetism, um, which is by and far any almost every other force other than gravity is that force. Like that's actually electromagnetism because it's the electrons in my hand and the you know the all of that sort of interacting with itself. Um, so uh, as well as that, just to finish off the list, if there's only four fundamental forces, there's the strong nuclear force which holds protons and neutrons together in the middle of a nucleus. And there's the weak nuclear force, which is responsible for certain types of radioactive decay. And uh, they, then you do the, well, there's a number for each of them, basically, um, of the four forces, which is, um, you know, how strong is the force relative to the other forces? And we can work out what would happen if that were different. So, for example, if electromagnetism were stronger... Um, actually, within certain ranges, atoms would be right and molecules would probably be all right. Uh, they'd still be there. What happens is, perhaps surprisingly, stars are in a bit of trouble. So stars are extremely important for life in the universe because they're a stable source of energy that you can park a planet near and have it orbit and, mm. and get sort of free, lovely energy for a long time without you know uh, too many troubles. But... The, the internal processes in a star, you've got nuclear reactions, you've got gravity coming in, you've got the heat pushing against the... All of that depends on the forces at play. And if you make um, electromagnetism too strong, you end up in a case where stars, uh, if they're big enough to ignite nuclear reactions, to be a star in the first place, they're also big enough that they overreact to any internal changes they don't sort of absorb any you know, oh, you know a little bit of asymmetry on this side or the nuclear reactions went off a bit more today than yesterday or something like that our sun sort of re returns to its normal state if it has a bit of a a, a change or a perturbation or a, an episode or something you end up with universes if you change that number where stars overreact and blow basically blow themselves apart so anything big enough to burn is not going to be stable for you. So they're sort of fairly entertaining ways of, of ruining the universe. <laughs> uh, it's it's possible as well that if you change that number... Well, what, one of the things we do know is suppose you make electromagnetism different to the way it is. There's a, there's a, if you have from high school the picture of, of water as oxygen and two hydrogens, the sort of Mickey Mouse picture, there's an angle that the Mickey Mouse's ears are on. And that will depend on electromagnetism. And we know a little bit about how much that changes. And with a bit more work, it seems like um, we could work out whether that ruins... Um, that sort of change in a molecule might ruin the possibility of something like DNA. Because, you know, it, it has this spiral structure... And we know that if you stick in sort of the wrong element in the wrong isotope that changes something, the, the structure goes a bit wrong. So there's there's sort of work left to be done here. But um, just quickly through the other forces, obviously, if you don't have the strong force, you're not holding protons and neutrons together in a nucleus. And that's another um, periodic table erasing kind of 
uh, thing. If it's not strong enough, then you know you're tr- you're trying to make a universe just out of hydrogen and helium, which isn't going to happen. If it's too weak, so that's if it's too weak. If it's too strong, nuclear reactions are much easier, and so stars probably burn out a lot faster. Um, so that's that's a problem. If gravity is stronger, again, that's the crushing force in stars. Stars would have to burn brighter to fight back against gravity, so they would burn out a lot faster. Um, planets would probably be smaller as well, but we're not 100% sure what effect that would have. Finally, the weak nuclear force is an interesting one because um, there's an interesting paper which suggests ways that you could balance the other forces and make other changes so that you don't actually need the weak nuclear force at all. It's... Um, you need what the 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 paper itself calls it judicious judicious parameter changes. Um, you've got to be a bit careful. But roughly, what it does in our universe, the reason it's important is it's one of the reasons why the sun is burning. Um, the nuclear reaction process that happens in the sun requires the weak force at a very crucial point uh, for certain reasons. So um, it all sort of fits together, mm-hmm. and if you get the the numbers wrong then the pieces don't there's no compensation here because it's a a a sort of basic it's it's a you know a a a finely tuned system it's sort of like the watch you know oh if i made this spring too big or if it was too springy or something would something else you know uh you know unless you're extremely lucky and something else comes along to compensate for it chances are you've got a broken watch yeah is it a wee bit like imagine it like a like a chain and each link has to be part of the chain. If that link's gone, then the chain can't hold whatever it's holding. Yeah. And so, for example, you, you're talking about the sun before. You know, if we had a problem with the sun and that explodes or, or isn't around anymore, it doesn't matter how well the the earth is, you know, we're going to experience the effects of that. Is, is that kind of what you're saying, the finally yeah. tuned argument? There's no, there's no sort of automatic compensation mm-hmm. going on. There are certain ways, if you're careful of, as I said, you know, judicious parameter changes if you change this one thing you can compensate it a bit if you change the other one but then you're sort of fine tuning just with two dials at the same time (laughs) there's you know these are it's physics it's just the basic stuff they do you know electrons do what 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 the you know equations say they do sort of you know that's what we're using to just define the universe anyway so uh it's very easy to make a universe where you know mathematically everything's fine you just do a prediction for you know, how's the universe going to expand or or what will be the bond strength of the proton and the neutron in this universe? And you can work it out in our universe and you work it out in that universe and, oh, zero. Mm. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just these other universes, what makes them easy to think about on one level is they're way simpler than our universe. Ours is the complicated one where if you want to know what happens in a certain scenario in chemistry, there might be a million molecules, <laughs> possibilities involved. If you kind of ruin the universe, there's only one molecule around, then it, uh, chemistry gets really easy. Mm. Yeah, exactly right. So for the listener who maybe uh, hasn't looked into all this stuff, has, doesn't know about the forces and, and, and all those numbers... Put simply, what is the kind of probability that this all could have come about by chance? Or is there a probability at all that it could have just come about by chance? Yeah, this gets into a really interesting point. So obviously, um, the probability involved can't be something like um, I observed a whole bunch of universes and 10% turned out to be all right. Um, which is the normal way you think about probability. You know, what does it mean to say the probability of rolling a six is one in six? Well, it, you might mean something like if I rolled that dice a whole lot of times, six would come up roughly one sixth of the time. Uh, that's what you mean. Um, that can't be what we mean here, but it, it there's a broader understanding of probability that we need for science. So if you know Einstein has his theory about how gravity works, which we don't need to go to in detail, but then physicists go, okay, what's the evidence for it? Do we think this thing's right? And a way of summarizing how strongly the evidence supports the theory is to use the language of probabilities. So uh, that's a f- sort of framework we want to use. But I can't possibly, if I say, given everything we've seen in the solar system and all the, all the observations we've done, 
and, and in the rest of the galaxy as well. If I say, you know, the evidence suggests that the probability that, uh, that Einstein's theory is correct, or even a comparative one, that Einstein's idea about gravity is better than Newton's idea about gravity, the probability of that is, say, 90%. I can't possibly mean that, you know, I've observed a thousand universes and 900 of them had, uh, that's the right number, isn't it? Yeah, 900 of them went for Einstein and the other 100 went for Newton. I can't, I can't mean that and yet, yet this is the way scientists use probabilities all the time. What we're doing is there's, there's a way of using probabilities to represent our sort of, the, the way that one statement supports another statement or doesn't support another statement. Um, so when we walked in this morning, it was cloudy and there's, we can say, all right, what's the probability that when we leave, it'll be still be cloudy and we can work out that number, but it doesn't represent like, you know, we've been to a thousand alternative universes or something like that. Uh, the, 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 if people want to Google this, this is called Bayesian probabilities. The point is that the, we can get probabilities, but we've got to remember what they represent. It's the following thing. Suppose um, all you knew, all I told you was something like, okay, there's a universe over there and it runs according to this set of laws, which is the same set of laws that we've got here. That's just sort of a, to simplify the problem. But I'm not going to tell you what the values of the fundamental constants are. Um, and so you go, okay, well, according to the laws, they could be over this kind of range. Mm -hmm. The way I'm going to represent mathematically, I don't know this over this range, is to say I'll, I'll lay down some sort of probability distribution to say you know, there's some chance it's here, there's some chance it's there. I can't, I don't ahead of time know where I'm going to be there. So I'll just represent that by, represent the I don't know with probabilities. <clears throat> this is the whole point of probabilities. Yeah. So when you've done that, um, what you've got is something like, okay, and then you can say, given that, what's the probability that I'll get a universe in which life might turn up? Um, and really it's the probability that some sort of structure and complexity is possible. When you've laid down that, and I've laid this out in a, a, a paper of mine called A Reasonable Little Question, uh, the numbers you get back are very, very small. Um, the sort of most secure cases of fine tuning once you've put those together given that we're dealing with the deepest laws we know about the fundamental constants that's there's a there's um i think that justifies treating them independently and you get numbers back of you know the probability of a life permitting universe is one part in i think 10 to the power of 136 was the number that i came back with um to give people an idea that's 10 with 10 with a so one chance in a one and or, you know, some number, a, a, a number with 137 digits in it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you that's just, you don't get to choose the probabilities you like and the probabilities you don't. That's what, just what comes back. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I was talking this over with a physicist friend of mine and the, 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 the what you do with a number like that is you don't bite the bullet. That's a bullet you don't <laughs> bite. The whole point of, of probabilities is to work out when we can sit content with our assumptions mm -hmm. and when something's got to change. So if I, you know, we, we get all the evidence, we say, what's well, the probability of Einstein? And we get 90% and we go, ah, yeah, we'll stick with Einstein for the moment. That's not bad. Um, if it was 99%, even better. If, if, if someone's trying to hold on to Newton and they're down to their last 1% of probabilities, it's, it's time to start thinking things through. But the whole point of this approach, this is why it's such a powerful approach, is that it, it recognises that ideas generate probabilities, not just observations. Mm -hmm. So you bring all of this together and you end up with a number. And if it's a really small number, you don't bite the bullet. You go looking back at your assumptions and say, which of these, something's got to be wrong here. Right, that you don't bite a ten to the hundred and thirty-six <laughs> probability yeah. for one in that uh, bullet, and so the the there's a this is why this is sort of a, a rather uncomfortable fact that that something's got to be done about. Yeah. So in your experience with other physicists who have looked into this, who obviously 
I know, a Christian like yourself, uh, what is the reaction when they see that the probability is so uh, low for a universe to have randomly happened like this? I mean, yeah. you would say that uh, this is good reason to believe in an intelligent designer and in, in a creator. And so uh, what's their kind of response? So one of the things that convinced... So, so Geraint Lewis, who's a professor at Sydney, and I have written a book about this called A Fortunate Universe. One of the things that convinced especially Geraint, to, to write the book, is I'd written a review paper about the scientific literature on fine-tuning. And on the back of that, I uh, was asked to give a talk at my own institution, Sydney Institute for Astronomy at University of Sydney, um, about this, which is kind of, you know, it's an interesting, slightly weird topic. <coughs> and the, the response to it was fascinating. I've never seen anything like it. So it was a room full of professional astronomers and astrophysicists. And I just take people through, here's this scientific paper, here's that scientific paper, here's the calculation they do, here's what comes out. Um, I didn't even really push the probabilities. It just sort of, here's the range and here's the small bit because it's it sort of, you can see that if there's any probabilities that come out of this, they're going to be small. And what was fascinating was the whole room sat around for an hour and a half afterwards talking about it, which is very, I've never seen it before. Usually you do it in an astronomy seminar, the, the speaker leaves five minutes at the end, there's a couple of questions. If people are super interested, they'll just talk to them later. But an entire room of people where everyone is just like, what is happening here, what's going on, uh, for an hour and a half, is what convinced Geraint that to say, uh, you know, we should write a book about this. He was thinking about writing a book anyway. Um, so Geraint's an atheist. So he, we wrote the first seven chapters of the book together. We agree on the science that's there, uh, except for one footnote that people can go and find. And um, then in chapter eight, it was a question of what does all of this mean? But actually the, the basic science, the, the stuff I've been talking about, change this number, change that number, these are the consequences. That's um, something that's grounded very well in the literature. And some people have, have, have you know, started saying, oh, you know, there's people who disagree. They don't disagree in the physics literature. So, so in other words, whether you're an atheist or not, whatever your worldview within uh, the world of physics, yeah. most of them would agree on the science, on the numbers. On, on specifically on the consequences of changing these right. numbers. Some of them get off the train at the point of, can you turn that understanding into a probability? Mm -hmm. uh, that's not where Garange and I get off, but um, that's where they say, okay, interesting, but you can't do anything with this. You haven't got any probabilities, which is why I think it's, it's important to sort of carefully build up the... There's a certain type of probability. We need it for science and mm -hmm. it will do us here as well. Um, but so, for example, Sabine Hossenfelder, who is known for, she's a, well, she's a physicist, um, wrote a book uh, called, uh, known for her YouTube channel as well as her science, um, wrote a book called Lost in Math, I think, um, and a follow up called Existential Physics, which. Um, um, <laughs> but Barnes turned out to be a big-faced Australian, end quote, I mentioned in there. Um, but she has written papers and books uh, and mentioned in the books where basically she's saying, look, you don't have any of the probabilities you think you have. These Bayesian probabilities are made up. They're just, they're just a function of the assumptions you bring. Um, and my response to that is we need these probabilities. Yes, they're just a function of the assumptions, but those assumptions represent our state of knowledge. They represent the way this supports that or this doesn't support that. I need a way of saying mathematically, I don't know. Right? <laughs> That's the whole point of probabilities. So that I have a baseline where then I start from I don't know and then the evidence can point me somewhere. Mm -hmm. But if I can't start anywhere, I don't think you can do proper you know, theory testing and data analysis without this sort of thing. So that's one discussion. That's not a line a lot of people take. But mostly the feeling like something's got to be done about this is fairly universal. Yeah. So, so in light of all of this, if people aren't Christians like yourself and would, would conclude, okay, well, this is good evidence for a creator who did finally tune the universe, what's the pushback you get? to that theory you know what are the biggest objections and how do you respond 
So the main one, the one that Geraint defends in the book, for example, is um, the multiverse. So sometimes um, something that looks unlikely has happened because someone chose it to be, right? You know, you come in and there's 50 coins on the table all heads up and maybe someone just put them that way. So it's important that there's just a reminder that 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 hypotheses, ideas gener- uh, 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 generate probabilities. So if you just see 50 coins on a table, there's no probabilities there yet until you start assuming something about how they got there. The whole point is to test those ideas. If I if if you say, oh, I was just flipping coins and I just flipped them on the table, I just flipped 50 coins and then they just landed like that. At that point, now I've got enough information that the probability comes out. Um, and it's extremely small, so I don't think you did that. I think you're lying. Um you know, and then the alternative hypothesis of I wanted to put fifty coins all heads up on the table. Um, so the um, with the multiverse, the idea is simply sometimes when we see something very unlikely, it's because the there were lots of chances at you know a, a lots of attempts at it. Why is it the case that some people win the lottery? Well. Lots of people buy different tickets, and that's crucial. You got to have both of those things. You have lots of people; it doesn't help much. If you've got a pro, you know some lottery where the chances of winning is one in a billion or something, there's no point two tickets or three tickets. That's not going to help you too much. Um, it's still going to be very unlikely that anyone wins. Um, and the second thing is they got to buy different tickets. No point in everyone buying the same ticket. That doesn't help you. That just splits it if you happen to win it. So, in applying that to fine tuning. Perhaps there are other parts of the universe as a whole, thought of as a multiverse, where there are different values of these constants. So uh, if we could get that sort of enormous bird's eye view on everything, we'd see a bit of the universe over there where there are heavier electrons and over there where there's lighter electrons and and a higher cosmological constant and stronger gravity and weaker gravity, you know. And it'd be just an enormous hodgepodge of areas all over the place uh, but most of them, there's just no one there wondering what went wrong. This is the other part you need. You need a um, a selection effect. Mm-hmm. So why is there a lottery winner on the front page of the newspaper? Well, part of that, you know, there's a lottery winner at all because lots of people buy different tickets. Why is this particular person on the front page of the newspaper? Well, they're not going to put a lottery loser on the front page of the, of the newspaper. So, you know, look around the whole universe and... There's no one giving a talk on, you know, why is the universe not fine-tuned for life? Because there's no one there. And so those two things together, you know, if it's true, that would perhaps come some way to explaining why we got the lucky results around here. There's more that can be said about that, which we go into in the book. One of the things you could wonder is, are we at least typical of the multiverse? Um, um, if, if I sort of looked around at my entire multiverse, most of the bits are dead, but I could at least go find all the bits that could support life and ask, okay, what are the conditions there? And if we're typical of that, those conditions, then, you know, um, maybe that doesn't need any further explanation. That would be fine. But if there's something really weird about what's going on in this universe compared to what most observers would see, that would that's a problem for the theory. That's, a, that's something about the our universe that the theory hasn't predicted correctly. So there's there's more to be done with the multiverse as a hypothesis. I think the main thing from my point of view is that um, just to understand what, what it's attempting to do, um, you know, we see the appearance of design in nature, in the natural world, in animals. There's a quote from Dawkins that I like from The Blind Watchmaker where he basically defines... Says biology is the study of things that have the appearance of design. It's not even they happen to be that. It's, it's almost how he defines biology, which is amazing. Uh, um, but he then says physics is the study of simple things that don't invoke us to that don't tempt us to invoke design. So he's hoping that physics saves the day. And so what's happened here is biology looks designed, and then and then just a just a straightforward glance at physics. Well, that looks designed as well. What if there's another level further down, like a sub-physics, some uber-physics, even further down where there's the right laws and the right conditions to to 
to explain why this level looks designed, which will explain why that level looks designed, why why the design at the the bottom isn't there at uh, the the seeming design at the top isn't there at the bottom, because right. it's followed us all the way down, um, and the way it's going to do this, the way a multiverse do that is going to do this is by basically just postulating physics that we don't know, that we almost certainly can't observe, that we certainly haven't observed. Um, and that, I think, sort of a backhand compliment to the, the argument that, okay, if we were just taking stock of where is science now with respect to the question, does the universe look like it has a creator, a mind behind it? The answer is, yeah, it does look like that. But I can at least somehow imagine a scenario in which, despite all of the appearances of all the sciences we've done, it might turn out not to be actually designed. Um and once you've framed it that way, it, you know, it's pretty clear what's going on around here, right? The the, the assumption is driving the, th- the theory. Now, there's there's lots of more to say about multiverses. They they really should be producing more predictions than they are, but we you know we don't know how to formulate them correctly. There's all sorts of worries about infinity, but that's that's probably the main response. Yeah, and so with, with the multiverse. Is there actually any evidence for it or is it more of an explanation in light of the um, probabilities when it comes to fine-tuning? Um, is there evidence is an interesting one. What there almost certainly won't be. Well, one of the things to remember is there's not the multiverse, so to speak. Um, so if you imagine you know, the hodgepodge of other bits of the universe, there's lots of ways you could have that hodgepodge laid out and generated or whatever. So there really should be... You know, we talk about there's there's should be theories of the multiverse. How do you how do you think it works? How how are you going to generate the universes? How are they distributed? Do you have more with heavy electrons or more with light electrons or about the same? Or all of those sorts of questions, your theory should be answering. You know, do physics, man. Um, and so, if you had a, a theory with that much detail in it, then we could we could actually at least do a sort of consistency check. In almost all of the theories, because we've looked very, you know, as far as we can into our universe, we can actually sort of see whether actually the electrons over there are different from the electrons over there. And as best we can tell, they aren't. They're the same. So almost certainly you won't get um, evidence of a multiverse in the form of I've seen different electrons or I've seen different conditions out there. We're not going to see these other universes directly. And that's um, a worry for some cosmologists. There's an interesting sort of editorial in Nature um, a number of years ago, about 10 years ago, by George Ellis and Joe Silk, who are two enormous names in the field, basically saying, look, what are we, what are we, what are we doing? You know, we're supposed to be scientists, empirical evidence, and you've got a theory here which by definition will never observe directly anything that's postulated by the theory. Um, and that's, it's, it's hard to argue with that, to be honest. Um, at the very least, though, there's a sort of consistency check that you could try, which is, oh, that, what I said before, imagine going around to all the bits of your multiverse with a survey clear, if there's a survey board, and if you meet anyone, go, well, what, what are conditions like in your universe? And if it turns out that the average electron mass that they all see is roughly the same as ours, then your multiverse has at least sort of predicted that at some level or it's not inconsistent with us. On the other hand, if your multiverse comes back with you know, 99.99999% of all multiverses, of all observers in the multiverse that I think exists will observe an electron mass which is heavier than ours or something like that, then you've got that seems like a disconfirmation. It it seems like your multiverse isn't explaining something about our universe. We would be rare. So there's ways of getting these internal consistency checks. I've done written papers on this trying to do this sort of stuff. Um, the the worry is for me is not so much that we can't do these consistency checks. The worry for me is because there's not the multiverse. There's just multiverse. There's just some multiverse. Um, there's lots of different ways you could do the hodgepodge. Um, this, the, the, the multiverse as a collection of theories is almost infinitely flexible. It could, it could, it could, there's always some other way you could put it together that explains things. Yeah. So uh, do you think it's more of a 
explanation or an attempted explanation to get away from intelligent design uh, by physicists who perhaps maybe maybe don't want to go down that route because I mean I don't I don't want to psychoanalyze people right and one of the things about science is it I, it doesn't matter where you get your hypotheses from I mean even if they did want to get rid of um, intelligent design you know there's a physics problem here of, of why do the constants have these values mm -hmm. and one of the answers might be they're not constants there's something dynamic that changes in different bits of the universe all right you know that's a thing to think and that's a thing to think about that's a thing you might want to go and test so i don't want to go psychoanalyzing and historically uh if you try and look you know why were people talking about the multiverse certainly fine tuning was in view but various theories in physics, in cosmology especially, were coming along that you know, might suggest at least a mechanism where something like this could happen. Um, you know, there's a theory called cosmic inflation. And, you know, I, I don't really care. There's a story about the guy who first worked out that uh, there's, a, there's a chemical called benzene and it's carbon, but they're, they're arranged in a ring. And where did he get the idea that they're arranged in a ring? It literally came to him in a dream. He was thinking about, he had this benzene and he didn't know what the structure was. And he had a dream about a, a snake chasing its own tail. And was like, oh, maybe it's a ring. And you don't criticize that theory by going, oh, come on, man, you can't dream up science, right? You say, well, that might be true. Let's try and find out. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it was true. So it just, I don't, I don't really care. If, if that's why people are interested in the multiverse, it's a way the universe could be. It's a way physical reality could be. And if you're not at the level of, oh, what if there's lots of stuff out there, but you actually do your job as a physicist, as a theoretical physicist, and actually make a model I can go and test and be specific about where the stuff is, then, then we've got something. We can get going on that. We can make predictions and see what happens. My major criticism of the multiverse at the moment is not so much that it's not science that it's all the 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 theories are sort of these toy models of sort of half half thrown together half ideas proof of concept there's there's all sorts of pretty serious questions about infinities about how on earth you deal with those so for example you might think you know what's the probability that an observer would see an electron as heavy as mine or heavier will go around in all the universe and if you find someone, ask them how heavy their electron. Count how many are heavier versus the total number that you found, the, the, the favorable over possible. Thing. And then there's your probability. Well, what if there's an infinite number of them? Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of these multiverses, they are talking about infinite numbers. Um, what do you do then? Well, you answer infinity over infinity. and uh, That's not an answer. And that's an actually very serious, very deep problem that... Um, you should just be counting observers because you can't have half an observer and you shouldn't be waiting this observer is more important than that observer because they're just they're observing their world. But you can't make probabilities equally weighted if there's an infinite number of them. Um, and this is a real, that's a real problem that, that should be taken more seriously. And so my criticism is that there's actually, that there's not enough science in the multiverse because people aren't putting it in the <laughs> multiverse. They should be doing more. Yeah, well, that's that's really good, Luke. Thanks for sharing about the multiverse there. Uh, to conclude today, I want to kind of take a step back a wee bit and talk more about the intersection of uh, faith, or more specifically being a Christian, and also believing the science. Because so often in things like comment sections and, and any, any Christian video, but in, in my Christian videos that I make, like comment sections and uh, talking to people on the street and talking to my friends, people don't see it to be possible that your Christian faith can go along with science. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you, know, you yourself, you are a very uh, well-respected and, and someone who's done a lot of research in this field, yet you still are a Christian. So is that statement true that uh, Christians can't believe science or they can't yeah. be into that? So um, the if you look at all the scientists, at least uh, where the studies have been done, it's probably sort of Anglo-centric, US, UK, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, I think the number's about 40% of scientists believe in God and that's less than the, a, the typical population. But it's not actually changed that much. 
Um, the last set of numbers are a little bit older, unless it's changed in the last sort of decade. And um, so I know plenty of scientists who believe in God generally and, and who are, as well as that, ones who are Christians. And um, I, th- I think there's a bit of a selection effect for why people get into science, um, which is if you're an atheist, then you know, what else are you going to get into? Like, <laughs> if you think science is the only reliable form of truth, then... You know, of course, you you want to be a scientist, but that's just more people who are already atheists choosing that career rather than a random selection went into science and and more of them came out atheists. So the way I put it together is the way that the makers of the scientific revolution put it together. They were almost all believers in God, almost all Christians, to be honest, and they went looking for laws of nature that were rational because they thought there was a rational mind behind the universe. And, and who, just very quickly, who were some of those big name scientists that people so, realized? So um, if you start the scientific revolution where it's usually started with sort of Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, those sorts of names in, in astronomy and there's other names in other fields. I mostly know my own, unfortunately. Um, they're all believers in God. Um, Galileo... Was a believe, was a Catholic. Uh, he might have regretted that bit, but he certainly believed in God. Um, um, yeah. Newton's an interesting one. He was probably a Unitarian, but he certainly believed in God. Um, and even before then, there's a, there's a line that we that often gets drawn in the sand before Copernicus. So he he publishes his theory that the Earth goes around the Sun in uh, 1543. Um, unfortunately, as he dies, which, which is a sort of bad luck, he had a stroke just as it was getting ready to go to print. Um, but before then, you have... It's not true that science just suddenly started there. You have these... You have people trying to understand... You know, this Arist- Aristotle's way of looking at the physics is pretty good. There's some bits that don't quite work. So there's guys like Thomas Bradwardine and... Thomas Bradwardine? I don't know the history well enough. Bradwardine, um, even going back to um, in in you know you can find guys in in seven hundred like um, uh, the Venerable Bede, who's doing the best summaries he can of what was known by the Greeks and then building on that and he's writing textbooks for his students. This is not um, in any way uh, uh, um, you know sort of his secret research or something. So, but that's the way that they. Thought, I mean, even you know, uh, Robert Boyle as a chemist, um, basically, right up until even in the eight, in the nineteenth century, the eighteen hundreds, there's a there's a some sort of stat like of when the Royal Society was started in England, which is it's it's so famous as a Royal Society of Science that they don't even put the of science; it's just the Royal Society, right? Um, which was, I think was started by around the time of Newton and it's just the oldest science society in the world, even into the 1800s, the 19th century, of all the various chapters and, and sort of vice people, the people in charge and the next layer down, I think there's some statistic like 80% of them or 70% of them were not just Christians but Anglican clergy. Um, so you had the, the country parson who preaches on the Sunday and then wants to catalogue, you know, all the botanical species in his area throughout the week in his spare time. Um, science is, is is still a bit of an amateur pursuit at that point in history. And so there's there's just nothing like the the conflict, the complete, you know, at each other's throats of science and, and Christianity in any way yeah, cause until that's manufactured at the end of the 1800s. Yeah, because it almost feels like that. Or you get that impression from, I mean, even going to high school or a secular high school, you kind of get that impression in the classroom or on comment sections and uh, maybe in, in news media. You, you seem to get this impression, but it's just simply not true. And I was uh, really not, not surprised because it makes sense, but to, to hear about these big names in science both today uh, like yourself and earlier on mm. to hear that these people were not just believers in God but as you're saying Christians who wanted to to worship and serve their creator yeah. I mean there's, there's verses in the Bible as well I can't remember off the top of my head but about how you know it's almost a, a form of, of worship and praise to go and 
explore God's creation and, and be be in awe about it. And it, and we truly can be in awe about His creation to to see the beauty of it and the complexity, and yet the design of it as well is so uh, really truly is awesome. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting is this idea that science and faith are at odds with each other is something we can actually nail down in history about when that idea started there were two famous books at the end of the 1800s um uh, andrew dixon white and i forget the other name um there's a good very good book look up the name dave hutchinson he's got wrote a very good book recently it's just about the, the the there were just two very influential books that came out at the end of the 1800s, which put forward this called the conflict thesis that science and religion and have always been at each other's throats. And it was just invented by two guys who had a real chip on their shoulder about one of them, you know, uh, yeah, I won't go into the details there because you, know, you can look it up for yourself, but the, we can see why they were doing what they were doing. Ironically, one of, one of them was a Christian who was just sick of Christians being a bit... Um, he wanted... He wanted Christians and scientists to get along a bit more than they had in history, but sort of over blew the case a bit. Um, um, and, but what, what's remarkable is that those books themselves these days are not taken seriously by any historian of science because they, there's just a whole... It's, it's bad scholarship. Some of the footnotes just are literally don't point to anything. You go, you go look up, try and look up their... There's some quote from someone. You go try and look it up and it's just not there. <laughs> It's it's remarkably bad scholarship, but it it's it so entrenches the idea, in particularly of the dark ages. Science was there, and it came along, and we'll take credit for that as humanists and for trying to forget that they were all Christians. And before then, everyone was just you know. and and what's been remarkable over the last hundred years, especially, is that the idea of the dark ages um, has. Is not is 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 almost not a phrase that any academic historian would use, especially not one who knows the 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 the, the period. So, the problem was that phrase started as 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 a Protestant sledge, Protestant <laughs> having a go at all oh, these Catholics. They had this dark age where they were in control and everyone was being oppressed, and unfortunately, a it wasn't true. Um, to, to a large extent. It certainly wasn't true of Catholics and science, right? The, the thing about the Galileo incident, whatever you think of it, is it's the only one. It really is. Um, you know, Giordano Bruno is burnt at the stake, but not anything to do with his scientific beliefs. And they're, they're the only two cases you can point to. And in the case of Galileo, when you start looking to the story, you know, he, he, try, he publishes a book that defends the idea that the earth goes around the sun. And he's brought before the Inquisition for it, and but if uh, that that looks like oh well, they're oppressing science, and then you you look deeper and he was a personal friend of the Pope, like a, the, for he'd written a book of essays which he dedicated to the Pope. The Pope had written a poem about Galileo praising his amazing. They were friends, right? So there's obviously more politics going on there, but those are the only. It's really just that. So there's this impression of, you know, for a thousand years the church burnt anyone who tried to look at the stars. and It's just nonsense, but it's so strong. It's such a strong trope. I mean, even things like people in the Middle Ages didn't think the earth was flat. That's not a, you know, there's like one scholar you can find who's not from the Middle Ages. He's from sort of the late, late Roman Empire who's a Christian who defends that. But almost all of them, that we can tell just, you know, the Earth's round. We know it's round. We we respect Aristotle. He said the Earth was round. So, you know. Um, but that idea, you know, it's, it's very tempting for any age to try to build itself up by writing off everyone who came before it. And that, so that's, that's one of the ways that the sort of scientific humanism and enlightenment tried to build itself up. Unfortunately, they got a hold of a really good sledge of the Dark Ages, which they got from the Protestants, which is a bit of a disappointment. But the point being that actually um, the idea that there is a mind behind the universe, um, you know, it's it makes sense of why there are scientific laws at all. It certainly makes sense out of this fine tuning. Um, it makes sense of why there is so much beauty in nature and why we feel such at, at, at one with it, I guess, why it, why it has such an effect on us. 
Um, and there's no conflict there between saying that nature obeys certain rational laws and there is a rational mind who made it obey certain laws. Those fit together, I think, nicely. Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree with you more, Luke. And if you're listening in conclusion, yes, science and faith don't contradict one another. You, we've got clear evidence here that you can uh, be a believer in, in both. And, uh, and part of being a Christian as well isn't just blind faith and, and wishful thinking. No, it's placing your trust based on the evidence that you have seen. And so there's many other routes we could go down, many other fields of science that we could look into. But, but for now, I think that's been really great, Luke. Before we finish the episode, do you want to tell us how people can uh, look into your work a wee bit more and connect with you? So yeah, as you mentioned, I've published two books. The, the, the one on fine tuning in particular with Geraint Lewis is called A Fortunate Universe. Um, that was published by Cambridge University Press. So that's, that's where we lay all of this out. Um, mostly still up to date. Uh, we've got a second book out. It's called uh, The Cosmic Revolutionary's Handbook, which isn't so much about the whole God and science thing. It's more about why cosmologists think that, to, that there was a beginning of the universe in, or something that looks like it in um, what we know as the Big Bang Theory. The reason we have, we published that one is people um, kept telling us how to do our job of uh, here's my idea of the universe. And so we just thought, look, for all the people who want to overthrow the Big Bang, who've got their great idea about how the universe works, here's how to do it properly, right? Here's how to really storm the castle properly. We'll lay it out. We'll tell you how to do it. Explain this, 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 and that. Explain why that theory is wrong. You know, we, so it's very much trying to boil all of the evidence down to here's the bits you really need to focus on. And beyond that, you know, Google around my name. I've got if you want to get into the details of the argument, there's a paper called A Reasonable Little Question, which lays out why I think that this is actually, fine-tuning is, is good evidence for, for God. Awesome. And, and if, you do, if you do what I did last night and search Dr. Luke Barnes, you'll see plenty of great YouTube videos as well and, and discussions that you've had. So Luke, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it, and I'm sure the listeners do as well. I've learned a ton from what you've had to say. And uh, yeah, I, I must get my hands on some of those books and have a read. So everyone, if you've enjoyed this episode, please make sure to leave your comments, uh, share the video around so more people can hear this good stuff. Otherwise, we'll see you on the next episode of The Garrison.